Administration of Credit and Financial Professionals and our technology partner, Credit to Be. I am here today with Pierre Aviditia and Ryan Maupin from Grant Thorin, who will be presenting on liquidation analysis in corporate restructuring situations. A few items to get out of the way before we begin. If you have any questions during the course of the presentation, you can ask them through the question function on your side panel. We will gather all those questions and save them for the Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you are looking for a copy of the slides, we will be sending a copy through the email after the presentation is complete. The last item that we have will be a brief survey that will pop up after the webinar ends. It only takes about 30 seconds to fill out, but it gives us a lot of great information on how we can continue to make our webinars better for you. Now to give you a brief intro of our speakers. Pure Ad is Director in Grant Thorin's Transaction Services Practice and is based in New York. He specializes in providing financial and operational restructuring, turnaround process improvement, capital raise, M&A, and transition advisory services in complex situations for companies and their stakeholders, both in and out of court bankruptcy process. Ryan has more than 15 years of restructuring experience, advising U.S.-based and international companies, secured and unsecured creditors, and sovereign wealth and private equity funds in workout situations both in court and out of court. Mr. Maupin is primarily focused on advising clients in sales processes, complex financial restructuring, liquidation, and serving in various internal management roles. And with that, I now pass over the presentation to you guys. Thank you, Roxanne. Uh, my name is Ryan Maupin. As Roxanne noted, I'm a principal in the transaction services group within Grand Thornton. Specifically within transaction services, I <clears throat> focus uh, most of my career on restructuring and advising uh, companies, <clears throat> both in an in-court and out-of-court, in, uh, in a variety of restructuring situations. Today, we're going to go through <clears throat> the liquidation analysis and how it can be used in, in a number of, of situations. But before I do that, I wanted to just briefly go over Grant Thornton as as, as a brief overview, um, we are a, a global accounting firm. We are um, one of uh, many international firms throughout the globe that provide audit, tax, and advisory services to our clients. Um, it's about a $5 billion uh, enterprise throughout the globe, um, and 10% of our revenue growth, um, we had a 10% increase in our revenue growth last year. Um, we, <clears throat> we are rapidly expanding our advisory services, I think in the next few years, our advisory services should eclipse the tax and audit service lines as far as uh, total revenue growth. Um, and specifically within advisory services, um, transaction services uh, has what I'll call corporate advisory services within it. And uh, within that, uh, we, we, we have a focus on restructuring. So um, on, on page five here, we've got an overview of the types of services that we and our group are, are, are used to performing for a number of different types of clients. Uh, that spans from, you know, regular turnaround type uh, initiatives for non-distressed clients uh, or clients that are slightly underperforming all the way to bankruptcy and reorganization uh, services for more of, uh, you know, a crisis or, or a situation where uh, the company needs to file for bankruptcy in order to preserve value uh, to stakeholders. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll go through uh, just a very brief overview of the types of uh, bankruptcy filings that we're usually dealing with and how uh, liquidation analysis may apply in each one of these situations. Most of you on the phone should be generally familiar with uh, Chapter 7 and Chapter 11, but for those of you who are not, I'll go through just a brief overview. Uh, chapter 7, <clears throat> we often refer to as a liquidation scenario in bankruptcy. And that is, that is simply a situation where the company uh, has liabilities far greater than its assets and are no longer able to uh, provide any sort of payment terms or uh, has ran out of liquidity for, for whatever reason um, and has just, you know, has, has no options left but then to close its doors and, and to liquidate assets. In those situations, a Chapter 7 filing uh, usually includes, most always includes, a, a Chapter 7 trustee that's appointed by the court, and that Chapter 7 trustee is tasked with uh, identifying assets that are able to be distributed for uh, all creditors in the case. That Chapter 7 trustee is paid a fee uh, based on the amount of funds that are, that are discharged in the bankruptcy, and 
through that, the, the, the ultimate result usually is uh, a dissolved corporation or entity and the, the, the company no longer exists. The debtor is, is, is no longer obligated at that time uh, once all assets have been realized and payments have been made. Uh, to, to do anything else with the company. A Chapter 11 situation, I would, I would liken that to, you know, our version in the U.S. of a second chance, uh, but there have been a number of changes to the bankruptcy code over the years, uh, most notably the, the 2005 BAPCA changes um, that have changed the landscape a little bit on how the cast of characters that usually participate in Chapter 11s uh, behave and how uh, debtors reorganize in Chapter 11. Uh, I would say that you, you're seeing shorter and shorter stays in bankruptcy now based on uh, some of the exclusivity changes that, that, that were, were made in 2005. The cast of characters that participate in bankruptcy is also changing. Uh, there could be an argument made that, that more sophisticated uh, creditors are getting into the game, hedge funds, private equity firms. Um, the, the nature of restructuring has also changed. I think what you can probably draw uh, a direct parallel to my example here with uh, what, what we're seeing right now in oil and gas and a, a number of other filings right now where you're getting pre, pre-arranged bankruptcy filings, uh, where you're, you're getting a lender, creditor, uh, unsecured creditor consent prior to a filing, and then uh, actually using the Chapter 11 for uh, the tool to effectuate change in as short a time, time frame as possible. Uh, chapter 11 is expensive. And, and, and we, you know, you can look back on a number of cases and point to, you know, all of the examples where professional fees and, you know, legal financial advisor fees and, and other fees and, and, and costs to the estate um, really deter folks from staying in Chapter 11 longer than they need to. So um, that's a quick overview of Chapter 11 uh, versus Chapter 7. Uh, I would say that we, we use liquidation analyses in both of these situations and I'll get to that in a little bit further detail as we go along in the presentation. Um, but next, we're going to talk about just a general overview of what a liquidation analysis is. Um, the best way I can describe it, uh, when we come into situations, mostly my work is focused on the debtor or the company side. Uh, one of the first things that we do as a professional trying to gain um, <clears throat> a clear understanding of what's happening is we put together a liquidity forecast, usually a 13-week cash flow forecast or some version of a monthly or weekly cash flow forecast. And then the, the, the next thing that we do is usually perform a liquidation analysis. Uh, and that will tell, you know, the folks that are advising the company a lot of things about, you know, where we are in terms of the capital stack, um, where are the secured lenders, what amounts are due, um, how, how, how do the various classes of creditors fall beneath that, and what assets are there really to distribute to those various classes of creditors? Uh, we use this particularly on the, on the debtor side when we're trying to negotiate terms of a dip facility right at the, the, the onset of the case. When a company files for bankruptcy, one of the first things that has to be established is whether or not there's enough liquidity in the entity or the, the debtor to fund a process, and if there's not, there's pretty there's a pretty easy decision after that, um, you know, on on filing for a Chapter Seven or Eleven. The the you know restructuring 101 is if you don't have enough liquidity or if you don't have access to capital to fund a process, there is no process. And so one of the things that we'll do when we get on the debtor side is try to you know ascertain whether or not um, you know there is over collateralization. And a liquidation analysis is one of those tools that we use to do that. So in simple terms, a liquidation analysis is compiling from the balance sheet, the latest and greatest balance sheet, what assets are there available to distribute? And then on the liability side, who and in what order do we pay those liabilities? And, and that um, is my best, my best uh, explanation in, in its simplest form on what a liquidation analysis is. Um, the constituents that, that usually are interested in looking at a uh, liquidation analysis, um, we, you know, it, it's, it's debtors, it's secured creditors, it's trustees that are assigned to the case or administering the case. It could be employees because they have certain uh, employee-related claims that have a higher priority than general unsecureds. Uh, it would be a general unsecureds in the bankruptcy, trade creditors, uh, bond uh, debt, 
bankruptcy professionals, other stakeholders, government agencies for tax purposes most notably. Um, those, th those are the folks that are going to be using a liquidation analysis or will be a party in interest when a liquidation analysis is, is performed and when it is distributed uh, to, to the public on, on a case, on a bankruptcy filing case. Um, it's important to understand where you stand as a best, as a, as a party in interest and, you know, we'll go through a little bit in the, in, in further on in the presentation on, you know, priority and how different classes of creditors are treated in a bankruptcy and, and how to recognize where you fall in as the respective party in interest. Um, if you're a secured lender, uh, that, that analysis is pretty easy. You're usually toward the top. Uh, in, in almost any circumstance in a bankruptcy proceeding. If you're an unsecured creditor, uh, the unsecured creditor claims can be different. Um, there are different types of priority of, of unsecured claims. There are different uh, priorities for administrative expense status claims, and we'll go through that in a little while as well. But I think my point is, you know, everybody in a bankruptcy case or a restructuring situation will have, will need to know how to recognize where they fall into and how uh, you know, some of the tricks and some of the, the, the procedures that people like myself uh, representing debtors or, uh, or advising creditors in some instances uh, look at a liquidation analysis and understand how they were put together in the first place. So uh, moving on to page eight, the best interest test uh, is, is a form of a liquidation analysis. And for, you know, for the chapter 11 scenario, if a company needs to, well, a company that wants to arrive out of Chapter 11, um, you know, get that second chance that we described earlier, they need to perform um, a liquidation analysis of sorts, and it needs, it's a component of many things that are required for a company to arrive out of Chapter 11 uh, in the form of uh, the two most uh, looked upon documents and, and the documents needed for a confirmation of a plan is the plan of reorganization, and the disclosure statement. And as part of the disclosure statement, any debtor that wants to uh, get a confirmation and arrive outside of a Chapter 11, they need to perform one test, one very important test, and that is the best interest test. And the best interest test essentially is showing all constituencies that, that have a say, any party and interest in the case, um, that unsecured creditors will receive better value or, or a better recovery in a Chapter 11 that they're proposing than in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And to do that, there is a best interest test that's performed. And essentially that is, uh, it's two liquidation analyses put, put out to get together and compared. And it's really comparing what creditors would receive if we just liquidated everything today versus what we would be doing in this proposed plan of reorganization and how we are going to treat the creditors in a Chapter 11 situation. And if the debtor can prove or illustrate through the best interest test that unsecured creditors receive a better deal, so to speak, in a Chapter 11 under the terms that they're proposing in their plan, uh, then that should be sufficient enough. That, that is a qualification that they need to perform in order to, uh, to, to check, check it off the box, so to speak, in order to go forward for, for a confirmation hearing. Um, with a bankruptcy judge. And so um, not only do we perform these on the front end like we described earlier, but we also toward the end of the case or toward the plan stage and disclosure statement stage, you know, this will be a, a very important part of, of any Chapter 11 process. And for those of you that want to see uh, what a best interest test is, I think, you know, a quick Google search uh, best interest test bankruptcy. We'll we'll pull up some bankruptcy documents, but you know all of the big cases um, will will have them. I think you know we've uh, we've got a few that we've prepared over the years that we could show um, as supplement if anybody wants to wants to see them. But they're pretty um, they're going to be in a similar form than what we're going to show here in the the, the back end of the presentation. Um, we're gonna we're gonna show a simpler form just just for illustration purposes here. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Prav, uh, my colleague here, for a little bit of overview on the types of liquidation analysis and some of the uh, some of the ways that we put together a liquidation analysis. Thank you, Ryan. So, uh, 
In terms of the liquidation analysis, Ryan gave a good overview on um, Chapter 11 and Chapter 7 cases. And uh, when we get to the liquidation stage, we think about as the, uh, let me just move the slide. Uh, on slide 9, as it shows, um, there are two types, which is the orderly and the forced. And the main difference between the two is really the time. The time is the main driver. Um, as the names suggest, orderly is a situation where you have an orderly wind down. And as it implies, you would have more time here. Having more time to wind down your business assets when you're thinking about closing the business um, will get you the best price. So if you have more time to, say, um, hire, if you're liquidating real estate, then you have time to hire a real estate agent. Or um, if you're liquidating equipment, et cetera, then the more time you have, the better pricing you will get. At the same time, um, as you have more time, you will also incur professional fees, higher professional fees when you um, when you have to wait for that sale to happen, for example. On the other hand, the forced liquidation, as the name suggests, force is really um, driven by some uh, pressure that you're getting either from the secured lenders or um, it's just determined that the business will not continue and there's no way to progress forward. So it's more of a fire sale situation. This is where you would end up hiring an auctioneer and auction off the assets as quickly as possible to get the best price. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to, to Parav's comments here. I mean, one of the things that we're, we're seeing a lot of right now in the industry is, is we look at the oil and gas downturns and, and some of the activity that we're seeing in, in the Texoma region right now. And, you know, this orally versus forced scenario is coming into play every day right now as banks you know, that have asset-based facilities that are secured with, you know, with inventory and with accounts receivable, um, you know, the valuations are going down on a quarterly basis by the appraisers, and there's one reason for that, and that is <clears throat> there, there, there is a, there's, a, there's a glut of inventory right now out there, and if you want to buy a frack tank right now in the market, you can pay probably five cents on the dollar for that frack tank or you might get it for free. It depends how, how desperate the bank is and what they're sitting on collateral-wise right now. But, you know, we ran into the situation earlier this year, I'm sorry, late last year, um, where we were forced to um, contemplate an orderly versus a forced scenario. And one of the, one of the big situations, or one of the big factors in, in, in deciding, you know, whether the liquidation analysis was going to be a forced or an orderly liquidation was the bank and, and how much appetite they had uh, to sit on the sidelines and wait around for uh, professionals like me as uh, we'll get to the case study here in a minute, um, you know, sitting as interim management, um, you know, wanted to, um, you know, deal with uh, a sale process and an orderly sale process, right? There could be value there in, in having an order, orderly sale process, but if you're having an orderly sale process, with assets that don't have a lot of value right now, regardless of how much time you use to market it, right? And if we're talking three years, maybe the market rebounds. But in the immediate term, and when we say immediate, we're talking like the next six to 12 months, you know, is the bank going to be comfortable with, you know, sitting on the sidelines, going after, you know, an orderly liquidation scenario where the price has already been decided because the market is already saturated because the downturn is 12 months in and it really doesn't matter if you wait six months or, or not, the assets are what they are. Um, so, you know, those, those kind of concepts and, and dynamics are playing out right now um, in, 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 a, in an environment where there is a lot of uh, hard assets and in inventory right now, um, and it doesn't really matter whether this is an orderly scenario or a force scenario, it's really just, it's, 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 it's depressed either way you look at it. So. Um, just thought I'd interject with a yeah, family absolutely. kind of Yeah, I think that was, that was a great point. I think um, that's valid and generally um, a lot of Chapter 7s we see are generally tend, tend to be of the force nature. Um, this orderly versus force distinction is important as you think about putting the actual analysis together because within orderly, um, your cash flows would be a little different and those all go into the assumptions 
that we'll look on the next slide, how they play in terms of what your recovery rates would be. Another point I would like to po um, make about the orderly is sometimes you want to take it, your liquidation as an orderly liquidation, uh, especially situations where you have some worn act issues where you can't, um, if, you, if you lay off or if you shut down a division and that requires laying off a, a number of employees all at the same time, there's worn act issues which could be invoked and you got to deal with that and that's a whole separate topic. So um, with that said, we're going to move on to slide 10, which gives you um, a high level overview of uh, starting off the liquidation analysis. And in essence, what it is, is we are going to liquidate our assets, um, as Ryan mentioned earlier. So to do that, what we do is we start with the balance sheet for the firm or the company. And we lay out all the assets on the left-hand side and come up with their book values. Now, these values are as of a certain date. Now, if it's a forced situation, then you're probably going to do it as soon as possible. If it's an orderly liquidation, then you could build a 13-week <clears throat> cash flow or a three-month, six-month, nine-month, whenever you feel the appropriate a wind down should occur and at that point what does your balance sheet look like so <clears throat> going down the balance sheet I think these are um, and from the balance sheet perspective you're generally going to put down the tangible assets um, sometimes there are situations where you would include your intangibles but most likely it's all your tangible uh, assets um, for um, illustration purposes, we have included all the asset categories here. Um, cash and cash equivalents. Cash is an item which generally you will get 100% um, recovery unless it's cash equivalents like investments or something where there's market pricing factors that you need to think about. Accounts receivables. Um, again, these, these are projected as of a certain date, but that's built off of built off of your sales projections and your collectibles and so on. So we'll discuss each of these categories in the, um, in the next two slides. What I wanted to point out over here is that these recovery rates that you see over here, you lay it out in terms of the low and the high scenario. You could lay out, you could break it out further into other scenarios if you feel that's appropriate, but generally the market um, norm has been that you have two scenarios, one in the low end and one at the high end, and um, going the, these recovery rates are generally provided, they are estimates using current industry trends, generally found, if you have an advisor, a financial advisor who has experience in doing this kind of work, would know what the general recovery is on certain um, assets. Yeah, I, I'd add to this, you know, the way it looks here uh, mechanically, you know, the liquidation analysis is not really just pulling down the balance sheet and saying, okay, what are my assets and what can I get for them? There is a schedule or a host of schedules that are supporting, you know, the front end of a liquidation analysis. Cash and cash equivalents, fine. You collect 100% of that usually unless it's restricted, right? Accounts receivable, um, <clears throat> there's going to be a rolling forecast on, you know, new sales, uh, on a 13-week basis, um, what those collect, you know, what those collection trends are, and then what's the likelihood of collecting any of the bad AR, right? So accounts receivable, that's probably one bucket here that we're illustrating, but it's probably made up of three or four buckets, you know, 90 to 120, over 120, good AR, et cetera. Um, and it's, you know, it's not just putting a, a zero next to old AR, right? There's, you know, there's situations where we have been successful in outsourcing collections of AR to third-party firms where that's all they do and we've had very good recovery rates on that. But those those recovery rates are really assigned um, not kind of putting the thumb up in the air and saying I think we can get 45 percent on the low end. There is a there's a detailed amount of analysis that goes through you know each one of these line items. Inventory I would say for situations where um, there's there's quarterly appraisals done as part of a regular uh, reporting pack for, you know, ABL facilities if it's in workout. Um, if it's not in workout and they haven't been, you know, getting the, the very much attention from the banks, 
you'll probably have in inventory uh, appraisals done on a not so regular basis, not so quarterly basis, right? Uh, it depends, on, it's context sensitive to uh, the specific situation that you're dealing with, uh, but I'd say if you're going into workout, you probably have up-to-date inventory appraisals, and that's a good uh, source of information. But appraisals, you know, they're not always right, and there needs to be a really keen eye on, you know, the situation that we're dealing with and the likelihood of a total liquidation and meltdown and what that inventory really is worth, right? Because if you look deep into these, these appraisals, they'll have a net orderly liquidation value assigned, or, or NOLV they refer to, um, oftentimes in these appraisal reports, uh, note the orderly portion of that acronym, right? Uh, you know, if you don't have six months or a year to sell it, it might be worth a whole lot less. Or if it's in the industry that we're talking about oil and gas earlier, um, it might not matter, you know, what that appraisal report says right now because Ritchie Brothers is sitting with, you know, 15 lots full of frack tanks and it really doesn't matter. Um, so the land and buildings, right, um, you know, equipment I would say kind of in the same bucket as inventory. Uh, probably as a you know appraisal, but land and buildings, right? Whatever is on the book value, assigned book value on the balance sheet for land and buildings, that that land and building could be far more valuable than what's sitting on the book. So there needs to be a detailed analysis and and you know some third party appraisals done on whatever land and buildings, uh, you know the entity's got or or has possession of. Uh, intangibles, I would say probably the most notable intangible that you would you would list on here from time is intellectual property, or uh, brand name. Um, I've seen brand name go in some of the retail cases for a, a pretty hefty amount. And you can't just sit there and say, well, it's intangible to book value, you know, 9.8 million and we're going to collect 50 or 70% of that. No, there's a there's an exhaustive, uh, you know, analysis that goes into that. And there's people that specialize in, you know, brand value or, or, or IP valuation. So, you know, there'd be some work, um, you know, on that and assigning value to that. Um, Absolutely, and and that's a great point, Ryan, and a great segue into the next slide. Before we move on, um, as Ryan pointed out, I think um, that's a good point in that these estimates are there's sub schedules and there's a detailed analysis. Just sticking to the accounts receivable, there's lots of aging analysis that you do, as well as the debtor will be sitting with their uh, receivables and collection staff, and then talking about. Um, any troubled customers that they might have and what's the likelihood of collecting on certain receivables, certain disputed receivables and so on. So on the next um, slide, on slide 11, we'll talk about each of these um, separately in terms of some of the considerations and some of which um, Ryan pointed out earlier. We'll just go through some of these. Um, from the accounts receivable end, when you're thinking about what is truly possible to recover, you start thinking about what is eligible, what is ineligible in terms of receivables, which takes into account the aging, the bad debt aspect of it, any disputed AR, any intercompany accounts receivable that you will think about, which you would need to eliminate because you're not going to collect on intercompany. Uh, well, it, it may depend on the intercompany, right? True. Are they, are they, uh, debtors versus are they debtors, are they non-debtor affiliates? Um, how collectible is that intercompany? company? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then um, you, when you think about receivables, you'll start thinking about the projections and DSOs in distress situations could be different than um, normal situations. So your uh, day of sales outstanding could be either stretched or not stretched. You might be discounting your receivables to collect faster. So um, think about those. When when. Um, thinking about inventory, obviously market and industry conditions are important. The type of inventory, um, raw materials versus in whip versus finished goods is a separate liquidation value versus if you are liquidating, let's say, commodities, you get a very high recovery rate on, let's say, petroleum, gas, or um, chemicals, and so on. But then the, you also got to start thinking about uh, obsolescence or perishables or seasonality. For example, we had a, we had a client that used to be in, um, uh, they used to sell products for Christmas and Christmas items are only useful during Christmas. And so if you're liquidating this company in let's say a February or March time frame, basically your inventory is really not worth much versus if you're liquidating in let's say October. So timing, depending on the inventory, it is also important what your you can determine what your recovery rates would be. Equipment, um, again, 
uh, this is something that Ryan pointed out. We need to do a detailed analysis in terms of um, what that equipment is worth, what the market conditions are. Uh, for example, uh, oil and gas will revert to that again, or shipping, for example, has recently been in trouble where there's a glut of whether it's ships or oil equipment, um, drilling equipment. And right now, if you're trying to sell something in that category, the recovery rates would be very uh, different even though uh, traditionally in a non-distressed situation, the recovery rate, the fair market value in a distressed situation would be a lot less. Um, also thinking about um, useful life of the equipment or the condition it is in, uh, those are important things that you think about when you think about the recovery on those. Land and building is a special one here. Uh, again, timing is very important. R local real estate markets and trends are important. In a distressed situation, obviously, people are trying to, uh, there will be financial buyers who want to uh, take advantage of the situation. So, <clears throat> um, and then if there are uh, lessors on that property itself, and if you're trying to sell that property where uh, you have um, leased, uh, leased spaces versus non-leased spaces and so on could be um, a factor as well. Um, generally, what we have found is when you're trying to liquidate or um, under Chapter 7, you're trying to liquidate a building property, the leasehold improvements generally fetch very little recovery rates. Um, those are fixtures within the building, um, bookshelves, etc. While they might be, um, the fair market value might be much higher when you're trying to liquidate, generally we've gotten scrap value for it. So just things to think about. Intangibles is um, very rarely it shows up on the liquidation um, uh, balance sheet. As Ryan pointed out, I think there's a few intangibles that are worth um, liquidating. For example, intellectual property is one which includes, let's say, a certain customer list that might have been developed or patents that you might hold that might be worth some value. And getting a value, uh, an appraiser to appraise the value of those would be important and uh, might fetch a higher value than if you were just going to liquidate it at a uh, fire sale. So those are areas where, one, it's a balancing act between the timing, the time that's available to you and whether what's the cost of having these valuations done and whether that's going to fetch, whether it's going to be worth it for the differential that you will have between a fire sale versus a more orderly or a little bit more stretched out sale time frame. And that's why you present these um, low versus high sort of recovery rates, uh, which are again driven by one, you could hire your own appraiser, or you could also use sometimes liquidators, auctioneers, they have a good gauge of what's the market trend generally. Other assets, these are more they, they kind of include prepaid expenses or certain other kind of assets that most likely we have seen or in our experience has been hardly any recovery on those. For example, prepaid insurance costs or prepaid subscriptions and so on. That's just um, once you're liquidating, there's no real value to the estate or the trustee from these. And so generally they not, do not fetch much value. So. With that, I'm going to pass it on back to Ryan. I think he's going to um, talk about how the distribution is going to, how the distribution works in a Chapter 7 case, um, and what are the priorities or order of distribution of assets that have been recovered. Thanks, Prof. <clears throat> so we, we've gone through, I think, the top side of the liquidation analysis pretty much on how to assign recovery rates and and Ultimately, all of this builds up into uh, proceeds available for secured and unsecured and other creditors. Um, and I'm going to go through kind of the rules of recovery and, and distribution. Um, you know, it's pretty simple here. I mean, we, we refer to it oftentimes as the waterfall, and it, it's exactly as it sounds. In, in order for um, a subclass to get to get paid uh, or, or a lesser you know, in priority order claimant to get paid in a restructuring chapter 11 or 7, um, it, it, it flows through this distribution waterfall. And each claimant in each category or subcategory must be paid in full before the next 
layer of, of, of claimants gets paid. Um, if there's not enough to pay all of the creditors in, in the, the category, there's, you know, there's a pro rata distribution. So I'll, I'll, you know, when we talk about representing unsecured creditor committees, you know, one of the things that we'll do prior to being appointed is we'll do this, this recovery waterfall um, you know, for uh, the unsecured creditors prior to meeting with them and, and, and providing them with some advice and hopefully with some luck we get hired. Um, that's an that's a interesting process and we, we go through that all the time in bankruptcy court. But one of the things that we'll do is we'll pull down whether plan or reorganization is being contemplated or whatever, whatever general strategy is being contemplated in the debtor's affidavit and we will go through and say, all right, at the petition date there were secured claims of X. At the petition date, there were leases, you know, there were 200 leases of which maybe 150 are going to be kept and 50 are deemed to be rejected. And therefore, there's a damage calculation and they'll receive an administrative expense status claim for the rejection, the rejection leases and, and the associated damages for landlords. So we'll go through all, all of this, however the case is, is appearing to unfold per the affidavit. And for those of you not familiar with an affidavit, uh, a part of the first day motions is oftentimes, um, you know, kosher to provide, um, uh, you know, an outline or, or kind of a, an events leading to bankruptcy story for all parties in interest to understand what's happening in the case. Why did this company file for bankruptcy? What what is the company or the debtors planning to uh, to do to get out of Chapter 11? There's usually some sort of outline or story, and we'll take a lot of that information. Uh, that's outlined in that and a number of other first day filings to put together a, a recovery analysis. And when we say to creditors, right now as the plan stands, you set to receive 10 cents on the dollar. That means your pro rata distribution after all secures and administrative claims are paid, the unsecureds are, are, are 10 cents in the money um, on their respective claims and those are spread. And again, there's classes that are created and I don't want to get too much into that in that plan. It's, it's almost enough for a separate uh, topic, but I do want to I do want to move things along and, and talk quickly about um, the the order uh, of how we see things usually. So um, this is a general overview, and this could be different in a Chapter Seven versus an Eleven. But generally speaking, if you want to talk about the distribution waterfall, um, the trustee fees um, usually are, are are above the secured claims. So if we're if we're going to administer this case, one of the first things that we're asked in a in a debtor interview. When a, when a company files or a debtor files for bankruptcy um, and you're acting as a financial advisor or uh, in, in instances we've acted as interim management, the trustee that's been appointed, the U.S. trustee that will be appointed to the case will ask you some very specific questions. One of them will be, do you have enough money to pay me first or we're not even going to be here? We'll get the case thrown out discharged. That's that's a, you think that's a silly question, but they're asking it for one very specific purpose and that is we're following the priority um, distribution here and if you don't have enough pay, money to pay us you certainly probably don't have enough money to pay the rest of this waterfall so the next um, class or, 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 or order of distribution would be secured claims and that that would be you know again anything that's got a valid lien right and so that's another thing that we as professionals you know do on the very onset of a case is okay we've established what we you know what the lenders are proclaiming to be a secured claim, but are they really valid? And one of the things that we'll do is we'll do a UCC lien search and we'll have the lawyers pull that up and we've had cases where what we think or what the lenders thought were a properly perfected lien, actually we're not, the diligence wasn't done or the liens weren't kept up, the filings weren't kept up and for whatever reason what, what, what we thought or what the general uh, working group list thought was a secured claim sometimes doesn't end up being secured. So for those of you that are on the phone or, or participating in this conference call um, that are on the secured side, I'm sure that's one of the main um, diligence items or, 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 or to-do items that you have on a regular basis to make sure the liens are up to date. But if you're working on the company side, that's the first thing we do because it, sometimes it doesn't happen. And that secured claim can run down that waterfall into an unsecured claim very, very quickly. So um, the next bucket, you know, I'll call it, you know, it's administrative claims, but there are, very, there, are, there are degrees of administrative claims within this bucket. And there's Section 503B within the Bankruptcy Code that will outline these properly uh, in, in the respective order that they, they belong. But 
there's certain things that will get special treatment, professional fees being one of them. So um, there's a reason why they're, they're, they're higher up on, on the, the status on, on security is because, or on the distribution waterfall is because, you know, you need professionals, uh, depending on what side of the table you're on, you may like professionals, you may not like professionals, but they are necessary to, to, to put, you know, together the case and, and properly administer the case. So they're up there on a higher priority. Um, five, uh, there, there's certain claims that will be uh, given administrative expense that if you deliver value to a debtor in the bankruptcy case, so post-petition, if you deliver value during that case, that generally is considered to be an administrative expense status claim as well. Um, for goods or services delivered 20 days prior to the filing of a bankruptcy, um, there's a look-back period that, that, that is established, and anything that's the, the goods or services delivered also receive an administrative expense claim status. Um, taxes will also be uh, at a higher priority here um, in, in the administrative claim bucket. Um, moving down to unsecured claims, generally, I mean, unsecured claims are, are every, pretty much everything else. Um, I, I would say there's, um, you know, it's trade claims for the most part. It's, it's bond debt. It, it's, it, most, most of the nature of bond debt is unsecured. So most, uh, generally speaking, bond debt would be in the unsecured claim bucket. Um, and you, you'll have <clears throat> an unsecured creditor committee that's formed from these unsecured claims or these, you know, one of the things that first happens in a bankruptcy is the bankruptcy petition is filed and there is, depending on what district you're filing in, what follows shortly thereafter, maybe in the petition or a supplement to the petition, is a listing of top 20 or top 50, depending on the size of the case, unsecured creditor claims, or what the debtor believes to be uh, their unsecured claims. And then we'll move down to uh, subordinated claims, uh, some you know fines, penalties, um, punitive damages, and then we'll get down lastly to equity. Most of the time when you're looking at a bankruptcy filing, uh, equity most of the time is considered to be out of the money. Although there is um, situations where equity has been perceived to be in the money, um, and because of that, certain equity uh, formation uh, meetings for an equity committee have been formed as well. So it's not uncommon to see uh, bankruptcy cases with an equity committee. Um, if there's perceived value flowing down to equity. Um, let's move on to page 15. Um, you know, considerations for unsecured creditors. Um, you know, one of the things I think is important to just note on this page is file, just pay attention to the bar dates if you're an unsecured claimant. If you think you have a claim in a bankruptcy that's filed and you've been noticed, uh, you need to make sure that you get your claim filed on time. If you don't get your file, your claim filed on time, you, you may not you may not be a claimant, and you may you, you may perceive to have you know ten cents on the dollar recovery or twenty cents you know on the dollar recovery, and and may not um, actually get to to go and, and collect that money because you didn't file it on time. So we've seen um, you know some of that uh, can be avoided if you weren't noticed, if you can prove you weren't noticed properly. Um, there's ways around that, but I would say you know generally speaking. If you know that there's a bankruptcy case that filed and you are a creditor and you're unsecured in nature, it's best to get your claim filed on time. And there's bar dates that give you usually sufficient time, I, I would say all the time, uh, sufficient notice periods and sufficient time to, to put that claim in. Um, most folks use a, a, an attorney to do that, but um, I would say, you know, m most the most important thing out of this whole entire page is get it, you know, on time. And do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I was just going to add that even though um, and there's a proof of claim that you need to file as well. But even if you're not sure of the amount, if you haven't calculated, just getting the form in um, with with any amount is enough just to get your claim in there. And then you can always dispute the because amount. once the claim has been been received, and then there's a whole reconciliation process that goes forward from there. Yep. Um, but yeah, most important thing is getting it on time. Um, we're 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 running a little bit short on time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on unless you had something else. No, I think that. Um, we're good. I think you covered uh, the okay. most important pieces. So, so moving on to to page 16, um, you know, we we had a brief case study that we wanted to go over, um, really, uh, with the group here, and it was it, it's a it's a company that we represented earlier this or late last year called AMB Valve and Pipe Piping Systems. Um, it's a public filing, so we can talk a little bit about. 
some of the dynamics that unfolded in that case. But you know, again, you know, we 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 get the call, um, you know, very last minute that you know there's a problem with liquidity and we need to come and have a conversation with lenders. Uh, we have a conversation with lenders, of course, after we um, we make that um, initial liquidation analysis and that initial assessment of you know liquidity in general. And you know, again, we 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 put a liquidation analysis together. It suggested that um, there was there was access collateral for secured lenders in there, and what we really needed was a little bit of breathing room and some additional liquidity to fund the process. Now, this was a, a a little bit different of a situation because this was in the middle of the oil and gas downturn, and there was really um, there still is, I would say, in in some respect. Um, you know, very little um, optimism in the market right now. It's very unclear on how long prices are going to stay at forty-five to fifty dollars a barrel. At the time we were doing this, the the oil prices were hovering around thirty-five dollars a barrel, and at a certain point within this case, oil went down to twenty-six dollars a barrel. So, you know, knowing that fact pattern and having the uncertainty with the market, um, you know, we really had little choice but to really request some additional liquidity from the, the, the senior secured lenders in the form of debtor possession financing. Um, that actually, um, you know, one, one deal tell we've probably left out is, you know, usually if you're trying to get the senior secured lenders to participate in a dip, um, otherwise there's somebody that's going to jump ahead of them in, in terms of priority. So dip lenders really, uh, they, they receive what's called super administrative expense priority or super admin, or I'm, I'm super priority expense status. So they jump ahead of any secured claims. It's usually the, the, you know, nobody really wants to jump ahead of a secured lender. So the secured lender providing that there's, you know, sufficient collateral and, and, and enough, uh, well, in terms of collateral to um, secure the loan, they oftentimes will be incentivized to, to provide dip financing because they jump uh, to the very top of the stack in, in terms of priority. They also get to charge a little bit of extra interest. There's dip fees associated with that, et cetera. Um, and they're the first to get out, obviously. Um, so w in this situation, we did get a dip uh, loan with the secured lenders, and we ran a two-month process, a two-month sale process. But one of, the, one of the key items in this case was the liquidation analysis. I cannot tell you how many times we talked about the liquidation analysis in the very front part of the case, in the middle part of the case, and at the end of this case, we kept on going back to the liquidation analysis. How, how much are we covered, the secured lenders would say. Uh, liquidation analysis, where do employee claims come in, um, you know, in this case? So it was, it was the backbone of a lot of it. And so, you know, this is kind of a, you know, again, this has been sanitized. This is strictly for illustration purposes only. Um, we did not actually get to a point where we had this in a best interest test in a Chapter 11 filing in terms of a plan. Um, for a number of reasons, the, the case was actually converted to a Chapter 7 um, bankruptcy once secured lenders were, uh, were, were paid and the, the second liens moved in. Um, but for, you know, for purposes here, this is, this is generally how our liquidation analysis on the top end um, to get to net proceeds available for secured claims looked. And um, you can see here that we had a high and a lo low recovery rate. Um, we had an expected liquidation value assigned here as well. Um, you, you know, this is exactly what we went through in the very beginning of it. The only difference here is we've changed the numbers in this to make it a little bit more um, vanilla, I guess, and not to, because this was a, actually, we never released one, I think, to the public in the case. Um, but you can see kind of how it's laid out here on the top side, right? You've got cash and cash accruals. We go to AR, eligible, ineligible, other receivables that they had on their books, um, inventory that was eligible and ineligible. Uh, there was a large amount of inventory for this particular project where, um, for whatever reason on the borrowing, well, we know what, what it was, but I don't want to go into details on explaining it, but there was a large amount of ineligible inventory that was set on the borrowing-based calculations because it was obsolete and it was deemed by the bank to not be worth very much and it had sat there. It was earmarked for a very specific customer that actually ended up going bankrupt themselves. Uh, and it was very specific product design for the North Sea that, that was never going to get really, in their eyes, sold and, and, and fell out of the borrowing base calculation over time. But it still had value. And so we put that on the liquidation analysis because we know that if we melted all that down, 
we still could get some value for it. We had some quotes from um, some liquidators and some some auction houses that were willing to give us five cents tight unseen. So, uh, or I'm sorry, ten cents tight unseen, and we've we've got five and ten there for the high and low. Um, we've got fixed assets, and then we've got you know some of the other wind down and closure costs listed below to get to the net proceeds. Now, the order and how this is presented, you know, it will differ by whoever presents it. But generally speaking, you will see um, the priority scale being followed here. And you can see that the trustee fees are up on the top. Um, in this case, we had some closure costs because there was a certain scenario that we were, um, that we were, they were running through for the bank. Um, you know, the bank wanted to see a couple different situations. What if we liquidated today? What if we took uh, an approach to orderly wind down this operation? Obviously, the wind down and closure costs would come and then we would start distributing to, to secure and unsecure claims. And this was all in the, in the context of an of a out-of-court situation, right? So, um, you know, I'm sorry, in-court situation, but with wind-down costs over time, right? So, again, different scenarios will have different uh, line items in there. And those wind-down closure costs, there was a 13-week cash flow model that supported that. So there was, you know, 16 pages. Of, of analysis that went behind, you know, that one line item and wind down closure costs. Um, the estimated secured claims, you've got the revolving line of credit, you have equipment loans, uh, equipment loans um, all, all deemed to be secured claims. Um, then you see the recovery, the average recovery on secured claims. Uh, obviously, there were sufficient. You've got 11.6 in the, the low scenario. You've got nine, so we've got 100% recovery. And then you can see total proceeds available now for further distribution, and you see us working further and further down the waterfall. Um, you get the total admin priority claims of, of 1,250,000, 100%, because we've got 2 million to distribute, and then we get to net proceeds available for uns after unsecured claims. Um, so this again, it's just it's an illustration of what a, 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 a liquidation analysis uh, can look like in cases. I, again, we, we took this straight from one of our files, just changed the numbers. Um, working further down uh, the waterfall, you see uh, net proceeds available for unsecured, and then you've got trade creditors. Um, don't pay attention to professional fees; those are those are very specific professional fees, um, and some other claimants. This is again, you will see the order of these change by the you know by the type of situation that we're outlining here. Um, and then we get the average recovery. You've got 5.9% and 13.9% uh, recovery on secured claims. And we've got a total shortfall there. For And you can see the shortfall there is one of the primary reasons why this ended up getting converted to, uh, to a Chapter 7. Um, but again, at, at, the, at the recovery of unsecured claims, you know, one of the things that we would do for an unsecured creditor committee is say, all right, the debtor has shown us a 5.9 to 13.9% to recovery rate based on the assumptions here. Let's dig in on those assumptions a little bit and truly understand how they came up with those. And there are certain tactics that unsecured creditor committees will come up with uh, in order to increase these recoveries. Uh, and again, that's a separate um, topic and probably a separate, separate webinar, uh, but wanted to just show you what, what this looks like uh, for illustration purposes in a real life case. Um, I think we've, we've, we've reached the end of the presentation. We're a little short on time. We've got five minutes left. I'll, I think I'll open it up to the uh, to the floor here for questions if we have any. Yeah, Roxanne, it's back to you. Um, I'll let you handle the uh, questions. All right, first one. Since BAP CPA, how often do you see trade creditors take administrative claims under 503B9 instead of falling to an unsecured claim? Um, Roxanne, can you repeat that? Sorry, that was a little bit of disturbance. No worries. Since BAP CPA, how often do you see trade creditors take administrative claims under 503B9 instead of falling to an unsecured claim? Well, under 503B9, that, that's the that's the goods and services delivered uh, under the the you know 20 days prior to the, the bankruptcy. So if you've got you know if you've got a valid claim and you want to you want to receive administrative expense status for that claim, you're, you're fully entitled to it. The question becomes, do you let that roll? And if you are an active trade creditor and you want to participate in the, um, the go-forward business, 
we see that a lot. And sometimes, you know, you know, you'll have that admin claim for anything pre-petition. I mean, 20-day admin is 20-day admin. If you can prove that you had goods and services delivered 20 days prior to the, the filing of bankruptcy, that's your admin claim. Anything post-petition that you choose to do with that debtor also receives, um, you know, administrative expense status. So I think, you know, BAPCA was the, the event that changed that or added that rule. Um, so, you know, if you've got a 20-day admin claim, you're a 20-day admin. Yeah, and I think this situation generally tends to be in a Chapter 11 where there's a reorg where you would invoke that and you would provide defenses for why your claim should be considered admin status. Okay, ready for the next question? Okay, how do you do a liquidation analysis on a private firm? What information do you use if you don't have reliable financial statements? Um, this is from a, I, I assume this is from an unsecured creditor perspective. Um, that, that's a great point. I mean, if they're, if they're a private company and they don't have financials disclosed um, or they're, you know, they don't have public bond debt, um, there's not a whole lot that you can get. I would say that for a private firm, when you're looking to do a liquidation analysis or you're looking to just do any sort of analysis on a company, I would be very careful on what's deemed to be available out in the public domain for private companies. We try to analyze or try to cover private companies all the time um, that have, you know, Reuters or, or whoever, who, who's the, there, there's all sorts of firms, you know, there's Dun & Bradstreet, there's all these reports that are out there and, and deemed to have, you know, public information, you know, or, or disclose public information on private clients. I don't ever see that to be very accurate. There's some nuances to that. There's some, uh, you know, healthcare related entities that have certain tax filing requirements or not for profits that you can flow through, you know, tax documents and and, and figure it out. But if they're a pro if they're a private company, it's it's hard to do. Right? Yeah, unless and obviously this is an out of court situation that you're thinking about where they haven't filed yet and you're trying to think about how to estimate the liquidation value and it's, it's really tough because uh, we don't have that information so unless you can uh, you can request it but it's really up to them uh, to share that information okay ready for the next question yes given the lower of cost or market value rules why are recovery rates of assets lower than 100 percent do debtors not properly impair the assets the recovery rates are less than 100% for what asset or just any asset? I'll reread the question. Yes. Given lower of cost or market value rules, why are recovery rates of assets lower than 100%? Do debtors not properly impair their assets? No, I, I think, you know, the, it, it's not, you know, one, one thing to really keep in mind when we're talking about liquidation analysis is that you know, what's sitting on the books, um, that, that could be one reason. That, that, that could be definitely one reason. I think what's more important to understand about liquidation analysis is this is, a, this is an analysis of the business um, and what it's worth in a stress situation most of the time, right? So, you know, cash is one thing, right? You might have some restricted cash and you're not able to get that cash, right, because it's pledged to somewhere else. But cash is cash, and then you've got accounts receivable. I mean, accounts receivable are showing on the books that, you know, a million dollars, and we might not collect the million dollars because we're going out of business, and it's perceived that we're going out of business, and there's no incentive for trade creditors to, or uh, uh, customers to pay. Yeah. They might, you know, and it, this happened, I, I, case in point, this happened in the oil and gas industry, right, where you've got, you've got a number of mom-and-pop type shops, uh, $100 million companies, $50 million companies, $200 million companies, private companies, that just rely strictly on the rumor mill on who's in business and who's in, who's not. And, you know, with all of these supply companies that were out there or still out, some of them are still out there, you know, if you were deemed to be filing for bankruptcy, why in, why in the heck would we pay you right now when I'm struggling too and I'll take those dollars and pledge it somewhere else where I, I think I'm still going to get some value or some product, Yeah. right? And so that's a, that's a great example of it doesn't matter how we've accounted for accounts receivable, right? We've put them in the right buckets. Maybe we've done some, uh, 
maybe we've done some, you know, we, we do the bad debt, right? We, we account for bad debt properly, but there's still some, some, some unpredictability on what the recovery will be on AR. So in that case, uh, in a stressed environment, we will make an assumption that we will not collect all of the AR. Yeah. And there's a reason for that. They won't pay. And you know, and that goes that goes for a lot of the different assets, right? The other asset groups. I mean, even though you might be recording it accurately on your books, but it's like it's like looking at if you're going to go buy a car and look at the KBB value of it, are you going to really get that value when you're trying to sell or sell that car? I mean, it's just a very crude analogy, but that's no, what it goes. Value is determined uh, by who's willing to pay that price, right, or what price, right? And so, in a stress scenario. Uh, value complete it becomes a completely different game it's not how it was accounted for it's not it's not traditional valuation techniques as well right that some of those just go completely out the window and it is what it is it, it is whatever somebody's willing to pay for these assets and I give the frack tank example uh, because I, I sat in a conference uh, not too long ago an oil and gas conference where we had somebody from an auctioneer stand up and say frack tanks are, are literally worth nothing right now. Maybe the banks would pay you to take them off. And we had a banker stand up in the middle and go, well, frack tanks are worth nothing right now? I mean, they're sitting on their books at you know $10 million. Why are they worth nothing? It's because yep. that's the, the price that the market's willing to bear right now, and it's nothing because it's so oversaturated and nobody's doing any business right now. Nobody's pulling oil out of the ground or natural gas out of the ground right now because they can't afford to. So therefore, the frack tank becomes worthless. Yeah. Okay, next question. Are there violations of absolute priority? Why? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a loaded, loaded question. Um, let, me, let me answer that by, <clears throat> uh, let me answer that, uh, I guess, a, a couple different ways. Yes, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to cite specific cases, um, but there are perceived violations of absolute priority and it, when you when you start to read up on some of these examples, you know, w one of the things that's very apparent in, in all of these cases is that th there's a judge that usually rules on these, and the judge's decision um, is is by district. So you know, there are certain districts that debtors will file for bankruptcy because there is you know ample case law, and the the, the system is debtor friendly, and the system is a is a well oiled machine, so to speak, and I'll. I'll give Delaware as an example, right? Um, there are some cases that you can go back and look at, um, and I'll, you know, some big cases where if you look at absolute priority, um, there have been some some pretty sizable disagreements on how priority the priority scale was dealt with. Um, I, I think that's as far as I'm going to take it. I, I would say that this is generally the roadmap. This is the law, and I would say if you ask some attorneys. And some scholars out there that follow bankruptcy law, um, there have been some very big cases in the not too distant past that have been perceived to clearly violate absolute priority. Yeah, it's on a case by case situation. So it's, it's interpretation not, of the law. And it's not the norm, obviously. I'd say the broad majority, but there are situations um, that you can go and look up and see, I think if you probably just Google violation of absolute priority, you'll come up with some, uh, a very large case at least, one uh, that comes to mind. But yeah, um, there's been, and again, that's, that, I, I want to make a clear distinction that we are not lawyers, we are financial advisors, and um, that's a very hot topic and, and, and hotly debated topic in legal circles. Um, I think I'll just leave it there. Great. I actually have one final question. Ready for it? Sure. After a case, do you compare the actual liquidation value and recovery for each class of lender to your calculated expected liquidation value? Are the actual liquidation and recovery values publicly disclosed? Uh, again, I think it depends on whether it's out of court versus in court. Yeah, I, they're not. They're not usually disclosed on what actually got distributed. What happens is. There's a plan of reorganization that's that's agreed upon, accepted, deemed to be accepted. They go through um, that voting process. The plan passes. It's the confirmation hearing. Um, you know, occurs. The judge will rule on it once the facts are set in front of he or she, and 
it depends. If you're a part of a liquidating trust, um, or if you have been set aside in the plan of reorganization to dis, you know to receive distributions of X, you know you will see or you will be working with a trustee or somebody that's appointed by the court uh, that was you know because again this plan of reorganization it might be a plan that sets forth recoveries done secured you know down the road um, if there's ever a variance on that you know whoever's in charge of administering the plan, the remnants of the plan, right, the, the, the residuals, um, it won't be disclosed in the court necessarily. No, and in a liquidation it's usually a trustee has been appointed and beyond that it's really at the trustee's discretion. The court is kind of done at that point and a lot of times uh, these cases, liquidations could go on. We have, I've worked on liquidations where the trustee is going through, even though the assets have been liquidated, but then they go after, there's a litigation case going on for years, and the recovery could take years. So it's really at the discretion of the trustee. So, But if you're a party in interest that is set to receive a recovery in the terms of a plan, or if you're working with a Chapter 7 trustee in a liquidation, there should be transparency there on you know your status and and how you receive money. Obviously, if there's there's excess proceeds, um, you know those would flow. Yeah. And there should be somebody tasked with with letting the parties and in interest know that yes, okay, fine. We had an unsecured. You know, we we thought it was ten cents on the dollar recovery per the plan and per all the pro the, the procedures that we followed. It was eleven cents, and here's your additional, right? Yeah. If you're a party to, if you're a creditor on that case, you could reach out to the council. Especially if you've got a valid, you know, claim, and it's been it's been logged, and you're you're a voting class, and you voted on the plan, you should have access to all information that you need for any variances to the liquidation analysis. So, okay. hope that helps. Um, any more questions? We're happy yeah. to. Uh, um, you know, we have, we have, we can send out uh, our contact information, Roxanne. If there are any additional questions, folks can reach out to us and we can um, definitely answer any of the additional questions. Great. That's what I was just going to ask. So with that, we are actually going to close today's webinar. I would like to thank both of you for joining us. I would like to thank all of today's attendees for taking time out of their day also to join us. And with that, I look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Roxanne. You're welcome. Bye.